Here we'll learn the mechanics of respiration, how we breathe. We'll imagine the respiratory system as a well-oiled machine, which will help us learn its three key functions and components. To begin, start a table so we can list them. Denote that it has three main functions. Inhaling oxygen, which fuels the metabolic activity of our cells, exhaling carbon dioxide, which rids us of our metabolic waste, regulating blood pH, which is a product of carefully regulated blood oxygen and carbon dioxide concentrations. Thus, our respiratory machine facilitates gas exchange between the blood and the atmosphere in order to perform these functions. Now denote that our machine has three major components, the pump, which includes the muscular and skeletal components of the chest wall, a gas exchanger, the alveoli, which are the interfaces for gas exchange, a controller, which are areas of the nervous system that stimulate respiratory function. In this particular tutorial, we'll focus on the pump and introduce the gas exchanger. First, let's review Boyle's Law, which describes the relationship between the pressure and volume of a gas and dictates the mechanics of respiration. Denote that pressure 1 times volume 1 is equal to pressure 2 times volume 2. The pressure and volume of a gas are inversely related. We can think of it this way. Draw a mountain, then draw a balloon at the base of it. Indicate that the base of the mountain is a region of high pressure. Next, show that you've carried the balloon to the top of the mountain. Now indicate that this is a region of lower pressure. Assuming temperature is constant at the base and the top of the mountain, which of course it isn't, what happens to the balloon? Show that it expands. So the question is why? Indicate that its volume increases as the atmospheric pressure decreases. Now let's illustrate how Boyle's Law relates to our respiratory machine. First draw a pair of lungs connected by a trachea. We leave the mediastinum out of our diagram for clarity. Show that the lungs sit within a double-walled pleural sac. The pleural sac separates the lungs from the thoracic wall. Now show that the pleural sac is like a balloon filled with water. What happens when you press your fist against the balloon? Show that the balloon changes shape, but maintains a closed cavity filled with water. Return to our thoracic cavity and label the cavity in our pleural sac as the pleural space, which is analogous to the water in our balloon. Imagine that our lungs push into the pleural space like our fist did against the water-filled balloon. Next, label the following pressures, which dictate the movement of air during inspiration and expiration. Atmospheric pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, which is external to the thoracic cavity. Intrapulmonary pressure, also known as intraalveolar pressure, which refers to the pressure within the lungs and is equal to atmospheric pressure at rest. Intrapleural pressure, 756 millimeters of mercury, which refers to the pressure in the pleural space. We'll discuss the role of the pleural cavity in gas exchange elsewhere. Now let's draw the elements of our respiratory pump. Draw a sternum and ribs around the pleural sac. The internal and external intercostal muscles lie between the ribs, but we leave them out for clarity. Draw a diaphragm below the rib cage, which is a sheet of skeletal muscle that forms the bottom border of the thoracic cavity. As we'll see, our respiratory pump changes the volume of the thoracic cavity, which alters the intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressures in accordance with Boyle's Law. First, let's illustrate the movement of the respiratory pump during inspiration. 
draw an arrow pointing downward from the diaphragm to show that the diaphragm flattens and moves inferiorly as it contracts. Draw curved arrows pointing outward from the ribs to show that the outer ribs move laterally in this direction as the diaphragm contracts. Draw another curved arrow pointing outward from the sternum to show that the sternum moves in anterior and superior direction as the external intercostal muscles contract. We can use a bucket analogy to visualize the movement of the ribs during inspiration. Draw a bucket with a handle. Label the front of the bucket as the sternum and the back of the bucket as the spine and the handle as a rib. Next, draw another handle parallel to the top of the bucket. Imagine that the original handle has swung upward to this new position. Label this illustration diaphragmatic contraction. It shows that when the diaphragm contracts, it moves inferiorly and forces the ribs laterally outward so that they exhibit the same range of motion as the bucket handle. Now let's use a pump handle analogy to visualize the movement of the sternum during inspiration. Draw a water spigot with a pump handle. Label the spigot as the spine and label the pump handle as the sternum. Next draw another pump handle perpendicular to the spigot to show that the original pump handle has sprung upward to this new position. Label this illustration external intercostal muscle contraction. It shows that when the external intercostal muscles contract, they force the sternum anteriorly and superiorly so that it parallels the movement of the pump handle. Now return to our thoracic cavity. To summarize, write that during inspiration, the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles contract to increase thoracic volume, which the arrows in our illustration indicate. Denote that inspiration is an active process. It requires muscle contraction. Indicate that as the thoracic volume increases, the intrapulmonary pressure decreases to below atmospheric pressure. This creates a pressure gradient that facilitates inhalation. Show that air moves down this pressure gradient, flowing from the atmosphere through the trachea and into the lungs. Air flows from the region of higher pressure to a region of lower pressure. Gas exchange occurs in the lungs and carbon dioxide must now be exhaled. We'll discuss the details of respiratory exchange elsewhere. Finally, let's illustrate the movement of the respiratory pump during expiration. Indicate that the diaphragm relaxes and the ribs move back to their resting positions. The ribs move medially, as in our bucket handle diagram. Indicate that the external intercostal muscles relax and the sternum moves back to its resting position. The sternum moves inferiorly, like our water pump handle. To summarize, write that during expiration, the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles relax to decrease thoracic volume, which is the exact opposite of inspiration. Denote that expiration is a passive process, unlike during inspiration. During expiration, the thoracic muscles relax. Indicate that as the muscles of the thorax relax, the lungs elastically recoil to their pre-inspiratory volume. The elastic connective tissue in the lungs and thoracic wall produces this recoil, which is analogous to first stretching, then releasing a rubber band. Indicate that as lung volume decreases, intrapulmonary pressure increases to above atmospheric pressure, creating a pressure gradient that facilitates expiration. Show that air moves down this pressure gradient flowing from the lungs out through the trachea and into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is exhaled in this manner before inspiration begins again. This concludes our diagram.